Welcome to another ultralight aircraft design video from the ultralight airplane workshop. This video is part three of the series for the aerodynamic design of the UWS-4 ultralight airplane. And in this part, we're going to talk about engine sizing. That's basically figuring out the horsepower and in addition, talking about the size of the propeller. Now, if you looked at a few other parts in this series, you know that this series is based on Dan Raymer's book, Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders. This is a nice, fairly thin book that goes to aircraft design for light airplanes that really is simplified as the title indicates. But we are using this book to design an ultralight airplane. This is going to be a fairly short video, so let's get into it. Now let's go over a little bit of what we learned in the last episode. And by the way, if you haven't seen that episode, I'll put a link up here in the upper right hand corner. In fact, I'll give you a link to the better one. I made two different versions and I'll just put the link to the one I think is better, a little bit simpler to understand. As I said before, we're using Dan Raymer's book, Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders. Now I wanna emphasize this video is not a substitution for Dan's book. Dan's book puts a lot more detail and description into the equations and pictures and tables than you're gonna see in the video here. Otherwise, the videos would take hours and hours. So you might take a look at buying this book. So down in the description for this video, you'll find a link to the channel's website where you can find links to books on Amazon and in particular Dan's book that you can buy if you want to. And the channel will get a little cut of the purchase price for the book. Let's go over a little bit of what we learned in the last video. The primary purpose of the last video was what was called airplane sizing. And that's really determining the gross takeoff weight of the airplane. Now in determining this, this W sub zero, we figured out quite a few other parameters for the airplane. One was an estimate for the parasitic drag of the airplane, and another one was lift factor. We needed these two in order to come up with the lift to drag estimate. And then another thing I did not put in here is we figured out the range for the airplane and we used lift to drag in calculating the range for the airplane. And then the two other things were the fuel weight and the empty weight but really these are determined by part 103 regulations for ultralight airplanes. So we really didn't have to go through Dan's equations, his estimates to come up with either of these two. And that made it pretty easy then to come up with the gross takeoff weight. Now Dan talks about engine sizing on page 23 of his book. And engine sizing basically comes down to figuring out the horsepower for the engine. Well, in order to come up with the horsepower for the engine, we use things that we've previously calculated. One is the power loading, and we figured that out in part one, and that was basically 16.1 pounds per horsepower. And the other one is the gross takeoff weight, and we figured that out in part two, and that was 517 pounds. So you take the gross takeoff weight, divide it by the power loading, and that gives you the horsepower that you need to take off. So we can plug this value and this value into this equation, and we come out with 32.1 horsepower. Now I just happen to have a Rotax 377 engine and that has a maximum of 35 horsepower and it needs a nice airplane to go into so we're going to use that. So instead of 32 horsepower we're going to use 35 horsepower in the rest of our calculations. Well we've already figured out the engine sizing that was pretty quick and pretty easy. Next thing is prop diameter. This one's a little more complicated and not and not quite as straightforward. Now Dan has two equations for figuring out your prop diameter. One is for a two-bladed propeller and one is for a three-bladed propeller. And all you really plug in is the brake horsepower of your engine and that's horsepower that's delivered to the prop. And then this is a quad root. Now you can do a quad root on your calculator if you happen to have a square root. Just do a square root of your brake horsepower and then do another square root of that result and that'll give you a quad root and then you multiply it by the constant over here. So I've done the calculation for 35 brake horsepower for both two-bladed and three-bladed propeller. So here's the diameter for two-bladed, and that's uh, 53.4 inches, and the three-bladed is 43.8 inches. And we'll talk a little bit shortly why there's a different value for the diameter if you're two-bladed or three-bladed. And I forgot to mention that uh, the propeller calculations are on page 23 of his book. Now there's another thing we need to take in consideration and that's the tip speed of our propeller. So in order to calculate that, now here before long we'll talk about why to calculate that, but first let's talk about how to calculate it. And here's the equation to use. So you're gonna take the square root of this whole value down here, 
This V is the forward speed of your airplane, and you're going to square that. You're going to add that to the value pi, that's 3.14, times revolutions per second. Not RPM, revolutions per minute. This is revolutions per second, and this is the diameter of your propeller in feet. Now you multiply these three items together, and then take the square of that. Once you have the sum together, like I said, you take the square root. And that will give you the speed of the tip of your propeller in feet per second. For our ultralight airplanes, the maximum speed we're allowed to have is 55 knots. And that's due to the regulations part 103. And that turns out to be about 93 feet per second. Now, for the maximum propeller rotation speed in revolutions per second, I went and looked at that Rotax 377 that I said I was going to use. Its maximum RPM is 6,500 revolutions per minute. Now, we're unlikely to actually get that. We'll probably be closer to 3,300. But to give us a little margin of safety, I'm going to go ahead and use the higher number. And then I'm also going to use a Model B gearbox, and that has a ratio of 2.58. So in order to get the prop RPM, we're going to take the engine's RPM, and divide it by this 2.58. So that's what this is coming up with. And that gives us 2,520 RPM. Now, if I divide that by 60, which is how we would convert from minutes to seconds, that's going to give us roughly 42 revolutions per second. And that's what we're going to stick in, in here in our equation. And we're going to use that propeller diameter that we got previously up here on our prop diameter calculations. So we'll do it for both the two-bladed and three-bladed props. And we'll put the feet dimensions in there. So if we do that, we come up with these two tip speeds. This is the two-bladed speed, so that's almost 600 feet per second. And the three-bladed tip speed was roughly 490 feet per second. And if you convert that to Mach, which we'll want to look at here shortly, that's about uh, 0.53 Mach and 0.43 Mach. Now, Dan really didn't go into details on what to do with this tip speed, at least not very much. So he's got another book that's called Aircraft Design, A Conceptual Approach. And he talks a little bit more in detail there, talking about propeller selection criteria. And that's on page 260. He also talks about design criteria in another chapter, but what we're interested in right now is on page 260. And again, if you go down to the description for this video, down there's a link to the website, and on that website, there's a link to this book, and you can buy it if you want to. So Dan talks about a rule of thumb that's been around for ages and ages, and this rule of thumb is for propeller diameter. And that rule of thumb is keep it as long as possible, as long as possible. In other words, you want to keep the diameter of your propeller as long as you can. And the reason for that is, in general, all other things being equal, the longer your propeller is, the more efficient it's going to be. And if you kind of go back and look at World War II airplanes as the war dragged on, you'll notice that propellers got longer and longer and longer. They were trying to get as much efficiency out of those propellers as they could to get those airplanes to go as fast as they could. So airplanes like the Corsair had really long propellers. But there's a problem that you have to be careful of when you're getting that propeller long. You don't want your tip speed to be more than 950 feet per second. And that equates out to about 0.84 Mach. Now, why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Now, naturally, you really would not want it to go more than one Mach. Because if your tip speed is breaking the speed of sound, you're putting a whole lot of energy into just trying to break the speed of sound. The amount of extra power you have to put in to go from, let's say, 0.99 Mach to 1 Mach is significant. And you get almost no extra thrust out of it. So it's not really worth doing that. So you might say, well, you know, why don't we go up to like 0.95 or something like that? We wouldn't be breaking the speed of sound. So that should be okay, right? Well, not quite. For example, here's an exception that Dan talks about. If you have a wooden propeller, you want to try to keep your tip speed down below 850 feet per second. And that's going to be because your propeller thickness is generally going to be thicker on a wooden propeller. And that's for structural considerations. You just have to make it a little bit thicker. But why would a thicker propeller have to be at a lower tip speed? And that's because our propellers have an airfoil shape. And because they have an airfoil shape, the speed of the air going over that airfoil 
is a little bit faster than the free stream speed. In this case, we're talking about the free stream speed being the tip speed. So that means if our free stream speed is something like 950 feet per second, that airspeed over the airfoil, over the propeller, is going to be just a little bit faster than that free stream and could actually hit Mach 1. So that means there's a little shock wave over part of our propeller tip. Now the thicker the airfoil is, the lower the actual tip speed can be and still get that shock wave. So that's why you have to reduce the tip speed on a wooden propeller or more generally on a thicker propeller. Now I found this illustration from a publication from the FAA called the Aircraft Flying Handbook. And so they're basically showing the same thing I was just trying to talk about. But their Mach numbers are a little bit different. So we have an airfoil. In this case, they're talking about wings. And we're talking about the airfoil on a propeller, specifically the tip of a propeller. So in this case, they've got a Mach of uh, 0.72. And they're calling that the critical Mach number. Now, right now, the air is going over this airfoil. And they're showing that there's going to be a local maximum velocity because the air has to speed up going around this airfoil. It goes faster on the top than on the bottom just because there's some camber to this airfoil. Now, if it was a symmetric airfoil with a zero angle of attack, then the speed on top and bottom would be the same, but still be greater than the free stream speed. But then they're saying when this particular airfoil gets up to 0.77 Mach, you've got some supersonic flow local to the airfoil here on top. And there's a little bit of a shock wave back here that goes subsonic back here. So a tremendous amount of energy is going into creating the supersonic flow in this shock wave. And then they're also showing here at Mach 0.82, you also have the same thing developing on the bottom. It's just that the speed on the bottom is just a little bit less than the speed on the top. So the shock wave isn't quite as large. As I was saying, even though the overall airfoil has a speed that's less than the speed of sound, Locally, you can have supersonic speed of the air going over the airfoil. And like I was saying, that takes a massive amount of energy. So you want to keep the overall speed of your tip significantly below Mach 1. Now where this critical Mach number happens depends on the thickness of your airfoil and the shape of your airfoil. So some airfoils can get up, oh, pretty close to up to 0.85 or so before it starts having this critical Mach number. And some of them have to be pretty low. For example, we are just talking about wood propellers where they have to be thicker, so their critical Mach number is lower. Mach number where they start generating the supersonic airfoil and the shock wave. And then another rule of thumb is in order to reduce noise tip speed, because the higher the RPM is, the more noise it's going to make, you want to keep that tip speed below 700 feet per second. Now, of course, he mentioned specifically during takeoff because generally that's when you're going to be the loudest for people who are on the ground. But if you're up a couple thousand feet and you're going to maximum RPM, it's not as much of an issue. The noise is going to be attenuated by the time it reaches people on the ground. So you might be asking yourself, what diameter do I need to get up to these values? So what I've done is I've taken Dan's equation here for calculating tip speed and I've rearranged it to calculate diameter given the tip speed and your forward speed. So that's this equation down here. I've just rearranged it. So you take the tip speed squared minus your forward velocity squared, and these are feet per second. And then that value, you take the square root of, you don't take the square root of this whole thing, just these two speeds squared. You take the square root of that, and then you divide by pi multiplied by your propeller speed revolutions per second. And that will give you the diameter. Now, I would like to have my propeller be fairly quiet, so I want a tip speed of 700 feet per second. So I plug that in here for tip speed. I use my 55 knots here, converted into feet per second, and I stick with that same revolutions per second that I used before. It's 41.98 revolutions per second. When I calculate all that out, I get 5.26 feet diameter maximum. And again, that's for a low noise. Now, if I was willing to go up to a higher feet per second, I could actually have a slightly higher diameter. Now, here's some that Dan does not directly address in his books. At least I couldn't find it. And that's how to decide if you want a two-blade propeller or a three-blade propeller. Now, the Hartzell, the guys who make those metal propellers that are used on a lot of certified aircraft, they've got a little blurb on their website that says a two-blade propeller produces two noise pressure pulses for revolution 
but a three blade of course will produce three pulses per revolution but those pulses will be smaller at least as far as noise level goes and that's assuming that they're producing the same amount of thrust so they're saying that a three blade prop will be inherently smoother and therefore quieter but they don't explain why you know they gave this phrase up here saying that the pulses are smaller but they don't explain why that is and then of course you'll probably have noticed from dan's equations in general a three-bladed propeller has a smaller diameter than a two-bladed propeller but that's not explained why that is he just gives you the equations of course he's trying to make this book simple and not make it complicated so it's easier to understand but one of the drawbacks to that is a lot of the whys are not explained let's see if we can figure some of this out Let's figure out why a three-bladed propeller might be quieter than a two-bladed propeller. And let's assume that everything else about these propellers would be the same, and particular diameter would be the same. Well, in order for everything else to be the same, we'd have to have the same total surface area for our prop. That means each of the blades of a three-bladed prop has roughly 66% of the surface area of the blades of a two-bladed prop. Now, some of you might be jumping up and down saying, you can't do that. You're going to have a shorter cord, so your Reynolds number is going to be different, so you're not going to get the same amount of thrust. Well, you're right, but I'm trying to simplify this. And the difference won't be enough that my point won't still be valid. Now, you can assume, at least for this instance here, that the amount of thrust of each blade of the three-bladed prop is producing roughly 66% of the thrust of each blade of a two-bladed prop. And if you assume the amount of noise generated by each blade is roughly proportional to the thrust of each blade or the energy of each blade, that means the noise of each blade of a three-bladed prop should be roughly 66% of the blade of a two-bladed prop. Now, that's not going to be literally true. There's going to be some differences. But for our calculations, it should definitely be less. It probably won't be 66%, but it should definitely be less. So... What Hertzell said up here, I think, is correct. We don't know how much less it'll be. Our little simple calculation said it's going to be, you know, 33% quieter. That's probably not true, but it should be quieter. Now, if you remember, they're talking about the pulses. So they're talking about how high each of those peaks is. So for three-bladed props, those pulses are going to be smaller, the peaks are, than for a two-bladed prop. And that's what we actually hear. It's that highest part of the noise, the peak, is what we're really hearing when we're hearing noise. And that's what makes us think that a three-bladed prop is quieter than a two-bladed prop. Even though the total noise energy put in the air per revolution should be the same for both kinds of props. Now, this answer is greatly simplified, but at least it's better than not saying anything. It actually explains a little bit why the three-bladed props are better than two-bladed props as far as noise goes. Now, the next question I had is why, using Raymer's equation, does a three-bladed prop have a smaller diameter than a two-bladed prop? And I couldn't think of an aerodynamic reason for that. There may be one, but at the moment, it's escaping me, and I couldn't find anything in the literature for this. But I can not think of possibly a structural reason for that. Now, we said the surface area for a three-bladed prop, at least for each blade, is going to be quite a bit less than the two-bladed prop. That means the cord for those blades is going to be less also, at least assuming that the diameter is the same. It's going to be like 33% less. Well, if you're going to make that cord less, structurally, at least if you're using the same material, it's going to be a little bit weaker, and it's going to be less stiff. So that blade tip and that outer blade would be more likely to twist. In other words, it would change the angle of attack out there on the blade tip. And you would not want that. You want a blade to be, normally, <laughs> on most propellers, you want that to be fairly stiff out there. In order to make it stiffer, though, you're going to have to make the cord a little bit longer and thicker. In other words, scale it up. So how can you do that? Well, you reduce the diameter of it. And in order to keep the same surface area, then you would have to increase the cord a little bit. Now, you wouldn't have to go down a whole lot. You wouldn't have to decrease the diameter by 33% but you'd have to reduce it some in order to get that cord back up in order to make the blade stiffer. Now, there are also some other implications if you leave the blades on a three-bladed propeller the same diameter as a two-bladed. Since you've got to reduce that cord, you're also changing the Reynolds number. You might have to reduce that Reynolds number by up to 33%. So that's going to change your coefficient of lift, and it's also going to change your coefficient of drag. And neither one of those are going to be changed in the direction you want it to be. They're going to be a little bit worse.
So that would be another reason to reduce the diameter a little bit so you can increase the cord a little bit so you don't adversely affect your coefficient lift and coefficient drag out there on your propeller blades. So I'm guessing that's probably why three-bladed propellers are a little bit lower in diameter than the two-bladed propellers. But like I said, that's just a guess on my part. There are a number of other issues in selecting uh, propellers. For example, a three-bladed propeller is usually less efficient than a two-bladed propeller. But I think we've got enough into that for now. We might get into it a little bit later in the design process. What I really want to do is to kind of figure out what that maximum diameter was because that will later have an impact on other things like how high above the ground we're going to mount our engine. And in addition, get an idea of how far away things like a tail boom or nacelles have to be away from the center line of the aircraft where we were planning to put our engine. All right, let's talk a little bit about what we learned in this video. We figured out what the minimum horsepower we wanted for our airplane. That was 32 horsepower. And I'm going to use a 35 horsepower engine, a Rotax 377. And we also figured out what the maximum diameter of our prop will be. And we used that 700 feet per second for our tip speed. And then using what the maximum engine speed is and our maximum cruise speed, we figured out that that maximum prop diameter has to be less than or equal to 5.26 feet. Well, the next thing we're going to do in part four is some fun stuff. We're going to come up with the wing geometry. So that's going to be the surface area and cord and, and fun stuff like that. So I look forward to working on that. See you next time.